Welcome to Longevity Industries' presentation of the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I'm your host, Dean Phillips, and I am glad to have with me today, Rick Neff. Rick is from Rick Neff LLC, and he is the CEO. Welcome, Rick. Hi, Dean. Good to be on today. Great to have you, sir. So right off the bat, what is your big takeaway for the destiny of manufacturing? What do you see coming in the next five years? Well, like everybody, I wish I had the silver bullet to tell you where to invest your, uh, your, your investment dollars to make you uh, incredibly rich. But I can tell you that um, technology is continuing to change manufacturing. And the advancing of technology changes it in, uh, in almost every form of, of manufacturing. Hmm. Do you think that that is going to get more impactful or is it going to be just kind of waning as we develop the technology? Is it going to be pushing us out? Like some people think that there will be no need for man after this. <laughs> Well, I mean, you can see that our productivity has continued to increase over the years in manufacturing. And, and if we look at where technology has been implemented in, in other ways, if you look at, say, farming, we were all subsistence farmers um, back in the 1700s. And mm -hmm. today, a small percentage of the population can uh, maintain all our needs for food. Um, but that, that aside... Um, we still are going to need a significant number of people in manufacturing and, and people to, uh, to manage the technology and, uh, and people to, uh, to do a lot of the different things that we, we do in manufacturing. Um, you know, when you're making really large quantities of things, more automation can come in. But today we look at maybe manufacturing things um, in smaller quantities or things that are made bespoke for someone's uh, um, needs for a particular application. So things like additive manufacturing, where you're making things in small lot quantities, um, are still gonna require people to be involved in the process, uh, for post-processing parts, for uh, patch packaging and shipping and doing all those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, we're still gonna need people. Good. And I can tell you right now, my forefathers would be very disappointed with my uh, capability. I can't even get my lawn to grow, let alone anything else, so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, it's really fun to try and grow things today and get back to the earth a little bit. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, and it's fun to manufacture things to truly be a maker and use your hands and, and make things. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So tell me a little bit about your, your background. How did you get to be here today and your history of what got you into manufacturing? Well, I spent 40 years in sales and marketing, a lot of it, um, that's all for manufacturing companies, um, and usually selling some sort of technology, uh, oftentimes to help manufacturing, um, started in air compressors, uh, did aerospace components, including solenoid valves and aircraft engine sensors, and then spent a lot of time, uh, in the machine tool world, um, working with metal fabricating equipment and helping metal fabricators, uh, to improve their businesses using technology um, like laser cutting systems and then have spent the last uh, seven or so years in additive manufacturing and uh, looking at large scale additive manufacturing and how it can be used in industry um, along with, uh, with new and smaller scale um, types of additive manufacturing. Right. Now, now tell me a little bit about where you think, additive is going to fit into this total picture of manufacturing? Well, you know, additive is, uh, is a quickly growing segment of the market. And, um, you know, there were some predictions back in 2014 that we were going to make everything with additive manufacturing uh, in a few years. And that's simply not the case. You know, we, right. we use dozens of different processes in manufacturing and additive is, is just another process. Um, and it's a growing one. Um, you know, you look at machining and, and it makes up maybe $107 billion industry and additives only a little over $8 billion. Um, is additive going to be as big as machining? I don't think so, but I think it's going to be a lot bigger than $8 billion. Right. 
Yeah, it, and that, it's amazing the players that have gotten into the business, which I felt is what really jumped the perception in the media and in the average person's mind of manufacturing was when you started seeing big players, big names getting into it. Because for maybe you or I, we may know some of the 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 basic players in there, but the average person wouldn't recognize those names. But when HP and other companies on the high level started getting into it, it really kind of gave it some credibility, I guess. I, I hate to say that, but it, it just seemed to take off because I can remember at the one rapid show that that was the big thing. That's what the newspapers hit on. And that's where everybody kind of gained an appreciation for it. Do you yeah, think it's really interesting? You know, when you see names like general electric, all of a sudden or GE, um, attached to additive manufacturing that it, um, it really provides some, some gravity or, or some, uh, um, some reality to that it can be used for manufacturing. And, and it's amazing how, much hype has kind of been thrown into additive and, and how much um, reality is there. And, and if you just start looking at additive manufacturing, it can get really confusing. You know, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of different processes. There's seven basic ones, but there are a couple new ones coming along as well. Um, and they're in different materials and they're all suitable for different applications. And so it's really a challenge to kind of swim that, 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 um, uh, um, see and figure out where there's a potential for using additive manufacturing for what you want to do in your business. Mm -hmm. Does, does the manufacturing community, uh, have a, is it, is it more a, an understanding of how to apply it or is it lack of personnel to actually do the work that has kind of been a limiting factor for, for additive well, there, there really are, are a whole bunch of limiting factors and, and really trying to get an understanding for how to apply it is a challenge. And when you get a basic understanding, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but then you kind of need to figure out how to, to find the right um, process for what you want to do. Um, and once you find the process, then, then getting the right people to, to do the job is a challenge. And, and a lot of times industry overlooks all the things that need to go into additive manufacturing because we like to talk about it as additive manufacturing, but some people say 3d printing Yeah. and 3d printing, you know, we can use those terms, um, back and forth, but 3d printing really means a machine that makes a part and the actual making of that part is the 3d printing additive manufacturing is a lot bigger picture that you need to kind of look at how do you go from the beginning to the end of the process. So first, you know, we might uh, want to design a part for additive manufacturing using the right software systems and maybe topology optimization so that we can uh, minimize the use of material to give us the strength and weight of part that we want. And then we have to optimize the process for additive manufacturing. So not only do we just take the very basic software, which we call slicing, and take the CAD model and slice it into thin horizontal layers and then figure out the G code or machine code. We need to build it layer by layer. We also need to figure out if it needs support materials or some sort of other structure added to it during the process to optimize the process. We then get the part out of the machine and, and the part often needs to have powder removed from it or resin removed. Um, and then support structures removed and some sort of post-processing operation. Right. And there can be all different kinds of post-processing that need to go on to take that part as it comes out of the machine, the 3D printed part, and turn it into the part that the customer really wants. You know, right. if it's a metal part, it might need to be machined or it might need to go through a hot isostatic pressing in order to, uh, to get the right density in the part. Um, if it's a plastic part, it may be sanded by hand or use vapor smoothing to make it smooth. It may be painted. Um, it may be dyed. Um, and there are all these different processes that if you're just going to go out and you're a manufacturer and you're like, oh, I want to buy a 3d printer to get into this. There may be a lot of other things involved that, that you're not really, um, 
prepared to uh, to attack when you first start getting into it. Right, right, and and I think that's a challenge. I think for most companies, I think there's a level of fear. In boy, do I want to? I don't want to make a mistake because I think all of us have that concern of, boy, I just don't want to make a mistake. You know, I'm spending this money on, on this new process. I, I, I don't want it to come back and bite me. Do you, so what, there, there are a couple of solutions that can help people out and, and um, uh, a couple of different directions, actually a bunch of different directions to go to adopting additive manufacturing. And one is there's some good consultants out there. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the kind of thing that, that I can do, and I have lots of colleagues that are really good at it, that can um, work for your manufacturing company, come in and look at your processes and your parts, and recommend the kind of uh, machines or procedures you need to be able to implement additive. And another, another way that may be even uh, just as effective is in the additive world, there are job shops. And those job shops aren't called job shops and additive. They've got a strange name. We call them service bureaus. Mm -hmm. And you're like, why in the world do you call it a service bureau? That's the wackiest name I ever heard. And then once you start realizing what goes on in a service bureau, a small part of what they do is 3D printing. They do all those other parts of additive manufacturing that you need to be an expert in. So they would work with a company and go in and help them design a part for additive manufacturing. Nine out of 10 times when a company's like, we want to use, we want to make this part with additive manufacturing. You take a part that was designed to be manufactured some other way and you try and make it with additive manufacturing and it's, it's not a cost effective. It it does not work. Right. Um, One of my favorite examples was a, uh, was a sheet metal part in a machine that, um, that, that one additive manufacturing company was bragging about how they were able to uh, 3D print that part. And I'm like, wow, if you had a laser cutting system and a press break, you take you about three minutes to make that part out of stainless steel or mild steel or whatever you wanted to. And it'd be, it'd be perfect instead of a day in a printer. Um, yeah. <laughs> so finding the right application, the right parts really important. Um, and service bureaus can do that for you. And there are lots of good service bureaus around. Yeah. And it sounds the, uh, like you're talking about solution based is coming up. What is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Is that absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and, and one of the things we're really seeing is that um, additive manufacturing is, has turned the corner in the last year or two. And the, the, so the word that was used last year, the big word is, is scale. And now additive manufacturing is being done at scale. Um, a few years ago, pretty much additive manufacturing was being used to um, make prototypes, right. help you optimize your design, and then figure out how to really manufacture it in production. But today, there are a considerable number of parts that are being manufactured using additive manufacturing. Um without resorting to other things. What, what would you say if, if somebody's trying to get into this business and they're trying to, they've already been doing uh, manufacturing in a very uh, historically just, just a manufacturing with a fabrication equipment or stamping presses. What, what are some of the things that you can look at and say that this is a, an area that you can really improve? If, if you're coming in, what, what is it that, that sticks out to you right away and says, this is an additive application? Well, there's uh, one of my friends, Lonnie Love at Oak Ridge National Lab, says there's three killer applications for additive, and it's tooling, tooling, and tooling. <laughs> and... Uh, Um, You know, when we look at it, it's like, okay, well, you know, you need to make something. You need it really quick, uh, uh, something for part holding um, in a machine shop. Um, And if you've got a a simple 3D printer, you might be able to come up with a solution to that problem quickly and easily. Um, So we we look at tooling and fixturing as as an area that's the first place that it's easy to uh, adapt or adopt um, 3D printing. 
does where does material science come in in a lot of the additive now? Well, you know, there's there's a deep amount of material science involved in every different technology, um, and it really depends on on what parts you want to make and what technology you want to use. And uh, you know, there are a lot of additives, for instance, going into plastics applications. Um, there's a lot of metallurgy going into metal applications and, and fairly new processes. Um, the binder jet metal processes, which are coming along today, are, are promising high volume metal parts. Um, and uh, that's involved a lot of work from the, the metal supplier and the metallurgy side. You know, you look at HP teaming with um, GKN for metals and uh, learning how to do metal powders the right way. It's um, pretty exciting stuff. Are there any of these that are more seem seem to be more promising than others to have more technology, or is it really specific to whatever application you're looking at? Um, the, each different technology seems to have applications where it works best, um, and. The uh, older applications, the ones that have been around a while that are more mature, seem to have um, some really good, solid applications where they work well. And then there's some newer technologies that are still um, solutions in search of a problem or an application. (laughs) Right. And, um, you know, you're not quite sure where they're going to land or how they're going to work. But they're really cool. I see quite a few places that, that have robots that are using additive to develop specialty end effectors because depending on the part and if a part changes, they want to have the flexibility of changing the end effector to meet that part. Do you see more opportunities coming in, in those areas? Well, again, that's one of those tooling, tooling, tooling kind of things. Um, You know, an end effector is a a type of tool or a fixture that may be on the end of a robot. But, um, yeah, and it's it's fabulous. Some of the things that you can do, um, I've seen some end effectors with with compressed air or vacuum lines embedded inside the the part. Um, Really cool stuff. And, And some of the materials you mentioned, um, there's a lot going on with, say, nylon with carbon fiber in it that for a fairly inexpensive material on a fairly inexpensive 3D printer, you can make some pretty solid parts. Right. If you looked at where where we are today, what are some of the workforce challenges that, that, are, that are coming up in additive? Hmm. Um, you know, the design for additive part is one challenge. Um, people that that can think in the kind of three dimensions and use not just CAD software, but topology optimization software to uh, improve material utilization in a part, especially if something like um, strength and weight um, together are a concern. And that certainly would involve anything in transportation, aerospace or or automotive. You want to uh, try and reduce weight. Mm -hmm. And topology optimization is fabulous for additive manufacturing, but it can also be applied to conventional manufacturing. Um, A part that uh, um, has topology optimization might look just a little bit different if it's machined than if it's made with additive manufacturing. But you can still do some really um, great things to lower the weight of a part um, with topology optimization software um, before it's machined, for instance. Mm-hmm. Is there more? Um, you, machine, you machine away the material you don't need um, in the final part. Right, right. And that does that also include things like supports and uh, other parts that sometimes when you have a more complicated part, you need to build in or factor in supports. And then the good part, I guess, is that you can remove those and then reuse that material or recapture it to some degree. Sometimes you can. And um, so how you orient a part in a machine is really important. 
um, how you slice it because sometimes uh, the material properties are different depending on the way the part's built. And so having kind of a knowledge of the process and being able to figure out how to properly orient it in a machine to um, optimize the strength where you want it and minimize the support material is, uh, is an important kind of thing to learn. And it's, it's not, it's not just textbook. You can learn it. It's, you almost have to do it a little bit. Mm -hmm. It is in, in many ways, similar to material science, when you're talking about uh, bending a piece of metal grain structure is so important. The same is true with the grain direction on how you're going to configure the part, correct? Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you're looking at a part that's made with extruded plastic, for instance, which is, you know, one of the com most common and least expensive um, forms, the, the bond between layers is not as strong as the strength of the material along the extrusion. Mm -hmm. um, so you definitely want to orient the part, not to add a lot of stresses between layers. Um, and, and that's the fastest, easiest way to get into additive manufacturing is to buy a fused filament fabrication or FDM machine, um, that extrudes thermoplastic. Uh, you can find them for as little as a few hundred dollars. You can get an industrial machine for, you know, $5,000 and, uh, you could spend up to, you know, uh, three or $400,000 on a, on a, uh, FDM machine. But um, it's not a million dollars like some of the metal machines. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's that's really, I think, one of the challenges, especially for people getting into the uh, metal printing, which it is a, a whole different uh, animal altogether. Do you have any idea that you could make a suggestion? Let's say somebody who's in our audience that's an, a young engineer what advice can you give them about preparing for a career in manufacturing like this? Uh, you know, what's really interesting is there's this thing called the maker movement and that's people that like to make things and they're maker spaces that have uh, machines where people go and they, and they put things together. And, and I've talked to, second graders in school and it's like, well, are you a maker or not? Do you like to make things? Um, do you like to draw? Do you like to make things out of clay? Do you like to cook in your kitchen? Do you like to, and all these things are very akin to manufacturing where we make a physical product. And so just the idea to think about how something made when you look at it, it's something that you want to consider. And there are people that just think that way. Um, you know, there are people that, that look at something and want to know how it's made. Oh, that's injection molded. Okay. I understand how that's made. Um, and there are people that, that are like, you know, when they think about it, they think the way, um, you might think about well, where does food come from? Well, it comes from the grocery store. No, <laughs> it comes from a farmer and then it comes from a factory that mills the grain and, and bakes it into bread. And, and there are all these steps of the process and wanting to understand all those steps of how something is made is, is something that you know you want to be in manufacturing if that's something that really interests you. If, if you're like, oh, I'm not interested in that at all. Well, maybe you need to find some other way to, to earn a living. But um, um, to me, making things is really cool. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that because uh, uh, Mark Michalski, who's uh, the just recent past president at, at uh, SME, he is a, an avid cook and he very much compares manufacturing to working in a restaurant. The, it's just like an assembly line and you have to be prepared. You have to have things set and you have to be prepped. Same thing with your, when you're assembling a, a vehicle, even you have to have the parts there and ready to, to go. If not, you're going to slow the line down and no one's going to be happy. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's a lean manufacturing exercise. When you walk into uh, Jersey Mike subs, for instance, it's like yeah. if they don't have one of the ingredients, you're not going to get your sub out the other end. Just like if they don't have the, 
um, seats for your car. You're not going to get that car out of the other end of the assembly line either. Yeah, that's right. And I, I, I always thought it was a lot like, uh, using like Microsoft project, which things do I need to start first? If I'm going to have a, uh, a, a hot sub or something like that, you're going to need to start <laughs> cooking first, not, you know, the bread and all that that's important, but it's, it, you need to start with the thing that takes the longest time. It's, yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. Uh, you, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it, you know, you think about it and, and all of a sudden a, a restaurant's just a small manufacturing plant uh, with a, a very custom product being put out of the other end. Mm -hmm. And, and, and how do you optimize that? And, and, it seems really simple when you look at the way fast food restaurants and things have really looked at making their processes lean. Um, but it's really the way a factory works and, and not, not very much different. Right. It's, it's interesting about how medical and hospitals have taken to lean even because a lot of them uh, now are highly focused on lean and, it's because the process itself lends itself to becoming more efficient. And I think that's where sometimes people think, well, I can't, how would I apply lean because I'm not in manufacturing, but things like that can be applied anywhere. Just, just like manufacturing principles can be applied anywhere. Yeah. It's funny. You might call it industrial engineering and there's a whole or manufacturing engineering and, and there's a whole, a curriculum of study on that. Um, you know, in the business school, there's management and that's a very similar thing. Um, but it really is just wanting to do the best you can. Right. You know, how, how, how can I do this better? And, you know, looking at some people call it continuous improvement. Um, but you know, you may figure out like, Hmm, how can I slice a melon better? Um, when I'm in the kitchen, it's like, wow, I saw a video the other day on someone slicing a melon and I never thought of doing it that way. And it's way better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I watch some of the videos that I see people make and I, I am really impressed with the ingenuity some people come up with. And to your point that if you have a certain thought process and you, you have this belief in problem solving, then there, there's not a lot of difference when you go into manufacturing because there's an opportunity there to problem solve what, whatever it is. If you have that interest in, in, in whether you're involved in the maker movement or you're involved even in a lot of people like coding, there's opportunities in that. And I think that we do need to look at getting the smartest and brightest into manufacturing again because they're going to be the ones that can really take us to the next level. You know, people like uh, Elon Musk with SpaceX, well, he just believed in it. And if you, if you have a belief, that's a, that's an incredibly powerful aspect. Of course, it doesn't hurt to have s several billion dollars, but. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, you know, he might've not done all the most efficient ways to do things at say Tesla, but you know, they make a pretty nice car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, um, you gotta, gotta give them kudos. And sometimes there's, uh, you know, a lot to be said for the way you've been doing things for, you know, 30 years and you understand how to do things. And then there's things to be said for completely new ways of thinking about doing the same things and trying to determine what's the best way to do it and having an open mind on what's the best way to do it, being open to change. Mm -hmm. And that's what we sort of started out with is technology is going to advance. And so, you know, how do we find new and better ways to do it? And, and in virtually every technology used in manufacturing, there are new things coming along. Um, you know, laser cutting systems, there's, all kinds of advances that have happened in the last two years that we didn't even think about before. Right. Um, and additive manufacturing is the same way. Yeah. It's, it's, in su it's such an, it's still in its infancy. So, so much that I think there's so many different ways that things can improve in that 
and a lot of it will come out of technology, some of this IoT stuff. How are we going to monitor better? How do we make things more efficiently? And then improving the speeds will come as we as we can monitor better and we know what t- temperatures things need to be set to. We're going to get better and more efficient and the speed will go up from there. Yeah, and the speed of innovation is is really interesting because, you know, there are people that have said in history that, you know, everything that could be invented has been. But, you know, if you kind of look at what's going on right now, there are more people on Earth today than there were a lot than than have ever died before. Right. So in my lifetime, there's more innovation that will go on in my lifetime that went on in all of history before that. Right. Yep. And so it's like the, the rate of, of innovation going on today in the world is just absolutely outstanding. And, you know, when I was in college in the 70s, if you wanted to be an expert in something, you needed to go get a graduate degree. Right. Um, you needed to you know, spend a lot of money or, or get a grant or do something like that and go to graduate school. Today, if you want to become an expert on something, you can in your spare time using Google and following um, the thought leaders in industry on LinkedIn and Twitter and, uh, and other social media, Instagram, um, you can really become an industry expert in almost anything you want to become an expert in. Yeah. Uh, you know, go to, go to conferences. And today, um, there's a huge groundswell going on that, that's really changing the way we think about marketing and the way we think about conferences, because no longer can we go uh, to an IMTS, or at least this year we can't go to IMTS nope. with 140,000 people at McCormick Place. Nope. Um, you know, that, that's just, with coronavirus, asking for trouble. Right. So how, how are people going to market their technology? And um, there seems that there are a lot of things coming along in the area of um webinars and online conferences and even online trade shows yes. that are changing the way we do business and, and marketing products. And that's a really exciting change. Um, especially when we're stuck at home and we don't have a lot to do. Uh, let's, uh, let's figure out how we can learn about technology while we're, while we're sitting in our home office. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a great time I think for technology I mean, there's been a lot of booms in different time periods, but I would put this one up against any of them. Absolutely. And uh, um, I'm looking forward to when I get to shake your hand again, Dean, yep. but it's probably not going to be right away. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like it. I was hoping it was going to be IMTS, but it does not look like it's going to be there. You know, maybe Fabtech, uh, but we'll see this year. So. Rick, tell everybody how they can get in touch with you. Well, um, I'm available um, at rick at rickneffllc.com. Um, I'll even give you my cell phone number, 513-808-7073. And I've got a website, rickneffllc.com. Great. Well, Rick, thank you so much. It's been great to have you here, and this has been the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I've been your host, Dean Phillips. Go out and make it a great day. Thank you, Dean. Let's keep making things. Yes. Thank you, sir. 